Okay. 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 So, uh, last class we talked a lot about the intellectual life of the Roman Empire, or the culture that Christianity found itself when it kind of was birthed into this world through Jesus. And I put off talking about Greek thought, because it's very big. There's a lot to, to go over with Greek thought. Um, I may have, Lee Leek was talking to me yes, yesterday or Wednesday, and I may have oversold the importance of Greek thought to Christian history. You don't need to know Greek thought to understand Christian history, like, you can, but it is nice to know Greek thought, especially Platonic thought, which is what we're going to talk about today, because a lot of Christian theology, especially in the early, like, five, like 100s to 1,100 time period, they borrow a lot of the terminology that Platonic thought uses to describe uh, the Christian to describe Christian theology. So, in order to understand Christian theology, it's nice to know Greek thought, but you don't, you don't have to know it. I think it's useful, so I'm going to be doing this class period on it. Um, a lot of the early creeds would use, uh, especially Platonic thought, in order to, to say it's like the Athanasian Creed, the Nicene Creed, that we may go over. Uh, not so much the Apostles' Creed, that we want to. And then a lot of the early theologians also used Platonic thought. So, especially Augustine, when we get to Augustine, he uses a lot of Platonic ideas. But Athanasius uses Platonic ideas. Gregory of Nazianzus uses Platonic ideas. Latin is the confessor. There's a whole bunch of them, a whole spread. So, I'm just uh, the definition say, of Platonic. Platonic. That's that, what I'm going to say. We're going to get there. Okay. That's what I'm going to be. This the whole class is going to be the right. definition of Platonic I thought. I need to know now. <laughs> No, it's good. We'll get there. Um, so yeah, that's as good a segue as any. Who was Plato? Pl Platonic thought is based off of a man. His name is Plato. He was a philosopher who lived in ancient Greece from around 420 to 350 BC. Yeah. So he was a very, very ancient Greek philosopher. Really one of the first... Um, very memorable Greek philosophers. We have almost his entire canon of works, so like everything he wrote. We have nearly everything. So that's incredibly helpful for the study of Plato and the study of Platonic thought, and his works have been extant and available to everybody since, you know, 420 BC until even now. People still read him. I was just reading him the, yesterday, and I was laughing. I was laughing my tail off reading him. He's funny. Um, that's one of the, I think, enduring reasons why Plato really stuck out and kept going for so long, because he's brilliant, and he's brilliant in a lot of different areas. So, 420 to 350 BC, he was born, as best we know, we don't really know much about his early life, but we think he was born in Athens, Greece. Um, he was born to an aristocratic family in Athens, Greece. <coughs> we know this because one of his contemporaries talked about who he was born to, and he loved to wear all the trappings of the aristocratic family, so he had like a ton of rings on. Apparently this stood out enough that his contemporary biographers were like, he like, blings up a lot whenever he goes out. Um, I found that interesting. Plato is actually not his name, it's a nickname. We don't know his real name. Plato, uh, or Pla Platon, it means broad-chested. So apparently he was a big man, and very good at wrestling in his youth, some people believe, because of that nickname. Um, we do know at the age of 40, he went out to an area called the Academia, which at this point just meant like a grove of trees, like out past the Athens where he lived. But he went there and he started a school. It's called, now it's called the Academy, which, you know, and now everything's called the Academy. When you go to learn something, you go to the Academy, right? So... Clearly was very, very influential. But yeah, age of 40, he goes out. He starts teaching a bunch of students. We don't have any of his lecture notes, which is like a lot, usually for a lot of teachers or thinkers, that's how we know what they taught, was like the lecture notes for the classes they taught. We don't really have any of them, but what we do have is the dialogues that he wrote, or it's a bunch of um, short stories, short um, philosophical stories, that is where the main ideas of all his uh, 
philosophic thought come from? So fortunately, like I said before, we have almost every single one of the ones he wrote. We even have some that people say he wrote, but probably didn't. Um, but people considered that he wrote. So it's kind of like the Apocrypha in the New Testament, right? Like there's these books out there that like people say apostles wrote but didn't. It's the same thing with Plato. We have dialogues that he wrote that he probably didn't, but they're out there. They're very interesting. So what's important for us in the Christian thought life is his ideas or his different theories. Like I said, he put them down in the dialogues. And the dialogues use this idea called the dialectic. When the dialectic is um, when you're talking with somebody and they have a different idea than you, you just kind of go back and forth trying to hone in on a specific idea, right? So um, for Plato, in his dialogues, he has this main character called Socrates. They're often confused, and it, it makes sense why they're often confused. Socrates, we think, was a real person. To the best of our knowledge, um, he lived a little bit before Plato. He was a professional sophist or... Um, like, professional talker, really. Like, they knew how to argue really well. So he would go around in Athens, and as told by Plato in his dialogues, he would go around in Athens and kind of, like, harass different people and, like, go at them about, like, justice and love and mercy and all these different kinds of meta-concepts. And that's really the main thing <clears throat> of what is happening in the dialogues. Socrates going around doing that. Um, but what Socrates found, what Plato found through Socrates in his dialogues that he wrote about Socrates, is that there has to be an objective reality behind this reality. What do I mean by that? And why is this important for Christianity? So for Socrates and for Plato through Socrates, what's important in his thoughts is the immaterial world, material world, and he is always searching for permanency and certitude. And this is really like any philosopher, right? Everybody, every philosopher is looking for what is actually true, what is actually certain, what is permanent, what persists. Because if you can find what's permanent, that's probably the best thing to base truth off of, right? If something's constantly changing, like if our idea of what is let's say, beautiful, is constantly changing, that's not probably what you want to base your idea of beauty off of, because it's always changing. So then, at one point, beauty could mean the exact opposite of what it meant before, and that doesn't make much sense at all, right? Like, you could say that, it's kind of like fashion, right? Like, you could say this uh, certain cut of clothes looked really good at one point and doesn't anymore. Is that, was that actually beauty, or was that something else? Plato would say it was something else. And in, in all his meanderings, and all his, like, trying to figure out what is permanent, he found this dialectic of the material and the immaterial, because for Plato, what he found was that everything that changes is material, right? It has a, it has matter, it has a material element in it. What does he mean? Well, he looks at, let's say, humanity. He looks at me, he looks at you, and he says, you change throughout your entire life, and yet you always remain the same person. Okay, so like you were young, then you go to like the middle age, and then you go old. You're always the same. Was it you as a person that changed, or was it just your material body that changed? Should we base our ideas off of you as a person, which isn't based off of your physical body, or should we base it off of your physical body as a person? This all makes a lot, starts to make a lot more sense when you realize Plato was a mathematician. So for Plato, math is the best, the par excellence, like the highest level of certitude that you can have. This makes a lot of sense, right? Like one plus one always equals two, every time, right? It doesn't matter if I have, you know, one of these, one of these and put them together, that's two. I have one chair here, one chair here, put them together, that's two chairs. These ideas of one and two can be placed on a whole bunch of different material things, but it always equals two, one plus one, it always equals two, right? So Plato looks at this math, and he says, okay, there's a element of the immaterial, these worlds of ideas, that they seem to be more useful, they seem to be more true, they seem to apply to more different, to a greater variety of things than just the material particular elements, right? 
So as he's looking at math, he says, well, what else inside of math or inside of the world of ideas can be applied to many different things and still be true or the highest form of truth? For Plato, he begins to look at the world of values or the world of forms. So <coughs> Plato talks about the world of forms. You'll hear it tossed around a lot if you start studying Plato. Basically, it's whatever's not material is the world of forms. I like the world of ideas because that's usually more of what he's talking about. He's usually not talking about, like, I don't even know what form means besides, like, in a platonic sense. It's not a word I use in the normal everyday language. I found that the world of ideas makes a lot more sense. But, we'll kind of bracket that and say, for Plato, ideas aren't something that's only in your head. Right? In our kind of English language, ideas just remain in our heads. Like, well, that's your idea, I have my idea. For Plato, ideas don't exist inside of our head. They exist somewhere else. They're an object of reality. There's something that, like, it's an object. It's not a material object, but it's something that's outside of yourself that you kind of, um, for him, it's a recollect you engage with or you participate in, but it's not something only in your head. Just going to put that out there in the beginning. And again, that makes a lot of sense with math, right? Because this chair is one chair, but it isn't the concept we have of one. This table is one table, but it's not the idea of the table. It's just one table that participates in this idea of oneness that we have, or like the idea of two-ness, now that there are two things here, right? It's all very in, in, out, out there. It's, he does not like the material world because it's always changing. So, forms and ideas. Math is one of them that is very important for Plato. And at the end of his life, he actually says everything is just math, which is kind of, everyone was kind of disappointed by that. But, you know, he was trying to search for certainty. But then he also says that there's values that exist outside of ourselves that we are always trying to reach. And this is very useful. Christianity engages with it a lot. And I think he's, I think he's right in a lot of what he's saying with this. What is a value? Let's say one of the things that Plato really loves to talk about is beauty, right? Everybody has an opinion about beauty, right? Everybody has an idea about what beauty is. And we're just going around and talking about it. When Plato, in his dialogues, whenever Socrates is talking to different characters, he asks them what beauty is, and they say, oh, well, I saw this, you know, woman walking down the street, and I saw that was beautiful, and I saw this chair and well, I thought that was beautiful. I saw this mathematical proof, and I thought this was beautiful. Socrates is like, you're asking the wrong questions, right? That you're, you're answering incorrectly. I asked you what beauty is. I didn't ask you what beauty looks like, or a particular act of beauty. I want a definition of beauty. This is what they call essences. I want, he wants the essence of beauty. And that kind of carries over in our language. You say, ah, uh, I mean this. Essentially, this is what I mean. You're saying, in the most concise and uh, quick way, I'm going to give you what I mean. Essentially, essence. It's like definition. Plato was looking for the definitions of really everything because he finds that these definitions are more useful in our life than just knowing like a particular thing. Like I know this particular chair, but if I know what a chair should be and what a chair should do, that's far more useful <coughs> and far better than just knowing that a chair exists. The particular values that he found, like I said, beauty is one of them. I found that he also loves justice. This makes a lot of sense too. Because when we all talk about justice, we all talk about beauty. We're talking about one thing, and we all talk about it like it exists, right? Like I talk about, okay, I found the, let's go back to beauty. I found a beautiful, I saw a beautiful woman, I saw a beautiful chair, I saw a beautiful, I know a beautiful mathematical proof. We are all talking and speaking as if beauty actually, it exists in itself, right? This idea of beauty we have, that it's a objective reality. We're not saying like, oh, well you have your idea of beauty about the chair, I have my idea about a beauty about this person that I saw. And those two can only, those two can exist by themselves subjectively inside of your head. You have a different view of beauty. I have a different beauty. 
view of beauty, that's fine. Peter says, no, you don't, we don't actually believe that, especially when we start talking about justice, right? Because whenever I go to a courthouse and I see people in the courthouse giving justice, like let's say someone murdered their father, and the jury says, okay, well, we looked at all the available evidence. We found that he had the murder weapon in his hand, and he ended up, we know that he killed his father, okay? That is an act of justice, right? Everybody can agree if you see somebody just murder their father, and you go and you put him in jail for it, this is just, justice is happening here. This happens in every single courthouse in the entire world, everybody is part. It seems like everybody's kind of participating in this idea of justice, right? Better for better or for worse. Sometimes people don't get it all the way. Sometimes people get it really correct. Everybody is doing this thing that we would call justice, and it seems to exist outside of the individual act that each person is doing or the individual uh, operation. Because one one act of justice is about making a a murderer going to jail is an act of justice, but then there's another act of justice of like, if somebody stole from you, and then you gave them, you got restitution for that, that's another act of justice. How can all these different particulars relate to each other, unless there's actually something they're all related to, right? So we have, we have this act of justice here, we have act of justice here, act of justice here. Are they all just separate, or do they all kind of point towards the same thing? And for Plato, he says, yes, they do point to the same thing. They all point to the act of justice, to justice itself. And if we can figure out what this justice itself is, then we can finally know what it is, and we can actually do it now. Do it better than we did before. But the ultimate idea for Plato is the idea of the good. Because he says, look. He says, everything in the world will participate in goodness. Everything in the world is trying to be good. Can we agree on, do we agree with that? More or less? Yeah, you can say, like, that's a good table. I can say, that's a good book. I can say, that's a good person. And, like, there, there's, of course, a degree in it. Like, some people, you can say, oh, they're evil. But that's only in relation to goodness, right? Like, you don't say, oh, this is evil because they're actually evil. say they're evil because they lack this quality that we see as good. Okay? So every single thing, Plato says, exists participating or imitating, more or less, this idea of goodness. And this makes a lot of sense, I would say. And it makes a lot of sense for Plato. This, we all are, we all become what we imitate, right? And we all become more and more good the more and more we imitate the good. If that makes sense. So, we have these ideas of goodness, we have these ideas of justice, we have this idea of beauty. He says they all kind of interrelate. Goodness, beauty, justice. Later on, truth gets added to this, right? And this, again, kind of makes sense. When you say, like, if something's good, it's also beautiful, right? If something is justice, it's just, it's always good. If something is true, true it's always good. They all kind of like, they're, they're just, they're like one, they're basically one thing. Plato says, okay, if everything is basically goodness, or if everything basically more or less imitates in this idea of goodness, how can we find it? What can we do? Shouldn't we be aiming for this? Shouldn't we all be aiming for what is good? We can't be aiming at the material world, because the material world is impermanent, it can't give us true knowledge because it's always changing. What isn't changing is this idea of goodness that we have, right? We can all agree that what is good now is going to be good later, and it was good back then. Like eating is good then, it's good now, it's going to be good forever, right? Procreating, good then, good now, going to be good forever. There's these things that are always good throughout all time. Shouldn't we be aiming at these certain things that are good? We shouldn't be aiming at goodness. And this is where Plato kind of um, brings up this allegory. It's called the allegory of the cave. You probably you may have heard of it. I'll kind of draw it just so we see. In this allegory of the cave, you have these poor fellows who are sitting here, and they're shackled to a wall in the middle of a cave. 
And all they see is these confused things on the wall. Looks like a man, kind of. They're being projected on the wall from this fire. The fire is hitting these uh, shadowy... Oops. The fire is hitting these material things, going down, making, making these confused kind of images. But it's all they know, these poor people who've been sitting here for all time. They're looking at these things, and it's like, well, you know, it's all we got, right? Like, this is all I know, this is all anybody else has ever known, so I'm going to say that this is true, and nothing else exists out here. And Plato says, no, there's these certain people who are like, you know what, this is really not true. I'm getting out of here. So some certain people will break the chain and try to escape the cave. They'll go past this fire and it's like, hmm, the fire can't be it because it's it's only creating these confused images, right? I gotta find what is actually true brightness or true light. They'll escape the cave. Mm. <coughs> get to the top of the cave. They'll get outside, and then they'll see light for the first time, kind of coming in from the sun. And they'll be blinded, right? If you've never seen the sun before, you're gonna get blinded. But eventually, as you get acclimatized to the light, and you look up more and more, wow, you'll be able to see light for what it truly is, and you'll be like, oh my goodness, this is what this fire was kind of projecting on here, this is what true light is, I've got to go tell these people down here about the light, goes back in, tries to tell them, they laugh at him, because they're like, you think there's this giant ball of light floating in the sky? That's crazy. All we have are these kind of images. Like, shut up and just listen. To, or just watch these things. Like, I don't want to hear you talk about this giant ball of fiery light. For Plato, this is what he thinks. It's an allegory about himself. Or for, he'll say for anybody who, when they figure out what is truly good, or what is truly just, it'll completely change the way you interact with the world. Right? If you've only been basing your ideas of justice off of this material world, or off of particular acts of justice, so let's say if you're only basing your idea of what is good off of what you were told as a kid, like, and that's, that's where you stop. Right? It's like, okay, well, my dad said that, you know, well, it, sir, whatever was good, um, I'm just going to believe that for the rest of my life. Plato says, no, you can't, you cannot do that. Like, that was, only, that was an imitation of what was actually true what was actually good, what was actually just. You have to kind of break out of these kind of mental habits and find what is truly good. Once you find what's truly good, then you will, it'll change everything, right? Like, if you know what is good, you're going to know how to live the rest of your life. If you know what is, like, actually good in every situation, what is the best move, what is the good move, it'll change. It'll change you. But people who don't know this new definition, and the people who don't know what is actually truly good, they'll probably laugh at you. So it's kind of like a catch-22. It's like, well, you'll have this better way of living. You'll have this better way of idea of living. But you probably won't get along very well with the people who don't understand this new view. <coughs> Correct views of justice. Right? So what is goodness? What is justice? What is truth? Plato doesn't give us, like, a huge... He doesn't give us a actual definition. He never gives us like a, a true essence of goodness, beauty, and truth. He just kind of says it's out there because we're all referencing it. We're all trying to be good. We're all trying to be just. We're all trying to be beautiful mm -hmm. to a greater or lesser degree. We know it's out there. You don't. He doesn't have a firm stance of what it is. He knows they all kind of interrelate, but it does exist. Um, what is What's useful, or is useful to me, to thinking about the good and the justice, the good, the true, the just, the relation of parts to the whole. Okay, so if you're a mechanic, what's more useful? Knowing how the entire car works as a unit, or knowing how an individual piece of the car works, how, how each individual piece of the car works. Better to know how the whole car works than just how each little piece of the car works. In the same way, Better to know 
how ju goodness itself works and justice itself works than to know individual acts of beauty, right? This is kind of the way he thinks about everything, um, but especially for the good and just and beautiful. We can see this, this is very, this will be very useful for Christianity later, right? That there is this goodness, there is justice, there is truth out there, and it, it does exist. Maybe not, in, not perfectly in this material world, right? But it does exist out there somewhere. Christianity kind of latches on to this idea, and they're like, well, yeah, goodness, truth, and beauty do exist. It's God, right? Because Plato kind of never, he never got outside of that. He says, I know they exist, but I don't know where. Like, it's hard to say where. It's hard to even say what they are. Christianity, it's like, well, we found it. It's God. And when you know God, it changes how you view everything, right? Like, it changes how you view goodness. It changes how you view truth. Changes how you view, even view beauty. So we can see how this, these kind of ideas that he has are very, very useful for Christianity. Another very useful idea that Plato had was ideas of the soul. Plato says that the soul is also immaterial. Again, par for the course, everything good for Plato is immaterial, right? But why is it immaterial? He says, like can only know like. Okay, so a human can only really know a human. A dog can kind of know a human, um, but not fully because it's a dog, right? But a human can know a human. And a human can know, can fully know a dog because of our rational capacity, but the dog can never know a human. If our ideas of goodness, truth, and beauty are material, and we know them, that means something in us has to be immaterial, and that's our soul. Also, if the ideas of goodness, truth, and beauty are eternal, and we know them still, there must be something inside of us that's eternal to know the goodness, truth, and beauty. That's got to be our soul. Right? So he has this idea that the soul is immaterial, it's eternal as well. What kind of gets weird is how we know what's good, true, and beautiful. And this has always been a problem with Plato. He says that uh, it's all recollection. Or we already knew what was good, true, and beautiful before we were born. And then we were kind of put in these flesh prisons of our bodies and we forgot about them. And the rest of our life, we're kind of trying to figure, to remember what was good and true and beautiful because we already knew it. Because our souls existed before we were born, we kind of out here near soul. And it was like looking at the good, the just, it was existing with the good, the just, and the beautiful. This is all just <coughs> crazy speculations, but this is kind of what he taught. We knew what was good, what was true, and what was just, but then we were putting our little flesh bodies. We're all sad because we're in the material body now. And the only way out of this sadness or confusion is to kind of rid ourselves of the fleshly parts, fussy desires of our bodies that stop us from thinking about the good, the true, and the beautiful, right? So kind of not becoming a glutton, you know, try, always living in a mean, um, not caving, not being a super lustful person. That's one way that you can kind of strip yourself so you can contemplate the good, the true, and the beautiful. And that would make you turn that frown right upside down. Mm. Yay. Now I know what's true and good and beautiful. I can go and live my life. And I'll be happier because of it, right? And I think, I probably should have said this earlier, but what, again, what kind of helped me when studying Plato was that he is trying to be practical. Right? He does say a lot of really uh, things that are kind of confusing for us modern thinkers. Um, we tend to view the material world and be like, no, you, you can learn stuff from the material. Like, you can get actual knowledge from material things, right? Like, the more I study plant life, the more I know, I truly know about the life of plants. The more I study um, politics, the more I can, or how humans relate to each other, psychology, the more I will actually truly know like, how humans relate to each other. We can look at the material world and gain knowledge. Plato, he says no. But then again, he's still trying to be practical. He's like, it, yeah, you can't get a true knowledge from particular material things. 
But when you do get a true knowledge of goodness and justice, your life is going to be better. If you know what is really good, your life will just be better. If you know what is really just, like every time you do an act in the outside of the real world, you're going to be a just person. And now, who doesn't want to be a just person? If you know what is truly beautiful and you know how to interact with that and how to, how to, how to create it, you're going to be a beautiful person. This is, these are useful things to have, right? Like, by any stretch of the word, you want to be good, you want to be true, and you want to be just, you want to be beautiful. So Plato's just trying to give us an idea of how to get that, right? But again, it, it's a strange method to get there by totally, by saying nothing, you can't really learn anything from the material, truly learn anything from the material world. You gotta sit and really think about beauty, you know? You gotta sit and really think about goodness, and then you'll know what's really beautiful, and you, you'll really know what is good. Like, ah, it seems a little, uh, it seems a little much to me. I, I like, I like thinking. I like sitting and thinking, but I also think you can learn a, a little bit more about beauty from particular acts of beauty, or particular things that are beautiful, than just sitting and kind of thinking about it. I wasn't also as smart as Plato, though, so he may have, he may have caught something I didn't. <laughs> the last thing that's important for Plato, for us, and especially for Christian thought, this is the idea of hierarchy. Or really it's just order, right? And every that's a natural human impulse, right? We all want ordered stuff. Again, to kind of go back to the mechanic idea of a car, right? Everything is ordered toward this really it's a meta concept of a car, right? Like whenever you make a car, all the little pieces are being put together to be a car. When Plato looks at that kind of science or that kind of, those kinds of things, he says, what if our whole world were ordered in this way? Right? There, because we look at our world and there is order in it. Right? Like the seasons go by every single year. The stars will always, are always rotating in the sky. The sun is always going around in a circle. He looks at this order in the world and he says, well, if there's order in this world, and there's order especially, again, in math, like one, when you add it together again, is two, add it together with the one again, that's three. There's this kind of order kind of emanating from one, or just the concept of one. That means there's, there must, it must be that way in all of reality. So for Plato, what is good, just, true, beautiful, existed from all time, eternally. Every idea did. But this is the prime thing. Goodness kind of necessarily diffuses itself, right? If you're a good person, people will know that because you'll be good to other people, right? Goodness gives. If this idea of the goodness is constantly giving, it created everything else in the world by first creating kind of like, let's say, the idea of what it means to be human. It created the idea of what it means for heat. It created the idea of what it means for whiteness or color. And then these in turn created other things. Boop, 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 all the way down until we got to the material world. Which is not it's not as good as the ideas of whiteness, heat, humanity, but it's you know, like and it's definitely not as good as this. And inside of the material world we have humans who are kind of a bridge between the material world and the physical world because we have souls that can know ideas, know the goodness, know the true, know the beautiful. But we can also know the material world. And then past the material world is that dreaded world of non-being, which is nothing. Right? So past material world is nothing. But fun thing about Plato, he hated poets. So between the material world and non-being is art. <laughs> because art um well, he was, he was often lamb uh, made fun of by poets during his time period. There's, often, there's like plays that were made making fun of him. Um, so he didn't really like them. So he puts art between material and non-being because he says, look, everything in this world is just a pale imitation of what's good, just, and true. And then artists are out here making imitations of imitations. So that's dumb. Why are they doing that? Knock it off kind of thing. Even though he was like a great poet himself. He was, he was a complicated man. But this is hierarchy, right? And you can see how this is... Christians saw this, and they're like, Wait, okay. 
Yeah, like the good, the true, and the beautiful, if you make the jump to make that God, created everything. And outside of that, it moves through, and then it gets, and all these, like human whiteness, he, that's all inside of the mind of God, like his idea of humanity. He creates hum humanity from his idea of humanity. Creates the material world, and we're kind of in between, <coughs> even in Christianity, where we're not just matter, but we're also not fully spiritual yet. We're kind of this in between thing. So people, Christians especially, saw this and they're like, oh, okay, very interesting. I can use this. And I'll kind of go into next class. There's about three different ways that Christians have kind of interacted with philosophy in general, but especially Platonic thought. Um, I'll go into that next class. But suffice it to say, Plato was a very fertile ground for Christian thinkers later in the world. He's been a fertile ground for everybody in the world because what he's saying, what he's talking about is generally irrelevant and it's usually what we think about. I think about beauty. I think about what it means, what truth. Everybody thinks about justice all the time. I think that's usually the most relevant one. We all don't like being wronged. And when someone wrongs us, our immediate gut reaction isn't like, oh, well, that was wrong for my time and place and it wouldn't be wrong later. It's always like, that was wrong, and I want, ju I want justice right now. So you can see how Plato's like, well, if that's the case, then there's probably justice existing out there outside of my own individual world. So, any questions? So, <clears throat> would you say that individual acts of justice that we have today, <coughs> are those the shadows on the cave wall? Yes. Okay. Anything that happens materially is a shadow on the wall. Okay. Yep. And that's, no matter how, how uh, true that justice is, it's still pointing towards the ultimate justice. It's always just an imitation, a participation or imitation in what was actually, what is actually just. And did Plato believe in a god? What was his, where was, where was the, the origin of this goodness? That's a great question. And people are kind of split on that. Um, if Plato was a theist or not. That, I mean, especially after Christianity kind of got its hands on it, it's really hard to like not look at his ideas of goodness, justice, and truth and be like, yeah, that's, sounds like God to me, you know? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. But for Plato, it was a little, it's harder to kind of, well, they're, parse it out. Their gods weren't really yeah, gods. Yeah, because in Greek culture, the gods, I mean, like Hercules and mm -hmm. Zeus, like that was a god to them. So it wasn't in his conception of God, but as he kind of thought about it, it started looking a lot like God. It was definitely prior to the god, the Greek gods themselves, like the good, the just, the true created the Greek gods. So it was like the highest level of mm. ontology or being. That Plato knew, um, but yeah, we don't we don't really know if he believed in God or not. We uh, in a or even a God, we know he was kind of um, loose and fast with like whether or not you should believe in the like Greek gods. So like when Socrates in the Platonic Dialogues is killed, um, he's actually martyred for corrupting the youth of Athens. Um, he says sacrifice a, a sacrifice a rooster to the to Asclepius, who was a Greek god. Plato was always like, don't rock the boat. It's stupid to rock the boat that way, right? Like, believe in the gods, don't believe in the gods. That doesn't matter. What really matters is believing that there is goodness, there is justice, and there is truth, right? Um, so yeah, he also believed in this. I didn't really talk about it. There's this creature, because how on earth do you get from the like ideas of goodness and justice, how on earth does that create the material world? Yeah. Right? Like, uh, what did he say? Eh, he didn't really, <laughs> he didn't really have a great answer to that, right? Like, if the, yeah, how, how on earth do you bridge the gap between the material and the immaterial? Plato didn't really have a great answer. He created this thing called the Demiurge, which was, it didn't really answer the question. So yeah, he's up the idea of the good, True. And he kind of hands off the job of creating the world to the Demiurge.
which could interact with the material world. Oh, and this is also important for platonic thought. The material world, raw matter, existed, it's eternal. So you have these ideas of the good and the true, start divide, and then matter. But they're like lesser. And the matter existed with the good, the true, and the beautiful at the same time. And then the good, the true, and the beautiful kind of acted on matter through the demiurge. Whereas for Christianity, God made matter, right? So that's a distinct difference between uh, Platonic thought and Christian thought. So yeah, he doesn't really answer the question of how, still, how does an idea work on matter? It's no great answer. Yeah. It never has been. So, I just think it's amazing how God, um, even though it's from what you're saying and people aren't sure if he knew of, about God, um, that God still used this man to point, you know, to, to make that ground fertile. So that people could put together, oh my goodness, this is God that yeah. I'm talking about. This was yeah. this Next is class, we'll talk about that a lot. And it's like, it was, it I mean, was it's useful. Just, it's, just a, it's just awesome to know yeah. that God uses, God uses anybody, anytime, anywhere to point down. Everything, too. Yeah. yeah. Even even philosophical systems, he'll like take in. Kind of like we talked in the first class, you have that, you know, the gospel kind of shooting through history. Like a rail gun, drawing everything along with it. And I think philosophy is one of them, you know? Like, yeah, Christianity didn't create philosophy, but it definitely took it and moved it further along and brought it into its orbit. And I'd say made it even more better philosophy, made it more true. In the same way with art and everything. But yeah. I think um, I think you're right. It is very yeah, God just kind of set everything up right on time. Absolutely. The fullness of time is when Jesus came. And I think this kind of proves it. I think Jesus came and these ideas were already there, but they were all around the entire Greek world, Greek-Roman world. And as soon as Christianity kind of hit it, they could immediately draw parallels between the good, the true, and the beautiful, and God, who is good, true, and beautiful. Yeah. Any other questions? The Egyptian uh, civilization is before the Greek and the Romans, correct? Could you say what uh, that was for 20 to 350 or whatever? How, how much? Oh, oh, can sure. you just throw something at me that puts it in perspective? The Egyptian culture, hmm. It's been around, like, the stuff we have from them has been around forever. I know they were at least a, su a, a superpower, like the biggest right. power, at 2000 BC. So that's 1500 years. So that's the difference between us and yeah. the fall of Rome. Yeah. Between Plato yeah. and, like, Egypt being, like, a actual nation, <laughs> super, yeah. national superpower. Right? It's the same distance. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they've been, they were a superpower for very long right. time. And the very impressive. God, so like there's that gap between the last book of the Old Testament and Jesus being born. And Plato's like living in that time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So the silent, we call the silent years, but yeah. What, what denomination do you think parallels that thought today? Platonic thought? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Yeah, Catholics... Well, they like Aristotle. They like Plato, all right. I'd say the form thought very much emulates Platonic thought a lot. With this idea of a transcending God who is good, true, and beautiful that even kind of transcends the appellations of good, true, and beautiful, right? Like, when I say God is beautiful, that my idea of beautiful isn't full enough to encapsulate God. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'd say Reformed thought. Because Augustine really loved Platonic thought and Reformed thought. Like Augustine. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more, if any other questions, please ask. He wouldn't have liked Jesus' incarnation then. No, no. We'll get there.
Not at all. I wouldn't have liked God, Jesus, God becoming material. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I think so. What is good, what is just wide open to you. Yeah, there's no definitions. Not really, yeah. Like, he kind of gets closer. He says, like, what is beautiful is what is in 